What's up, Joe? What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Sports 360. I'm Jeff Fennell, and I'm here with my man, Rob Duran of Rob Duran Sports. Rob, what's up, man? How you doing? Hey, go, everything's going well, man. How are you? I'm doing well, too. Doing well. Uh, there's so much going on in sports right now, it's kind of hard not to do well if you're a sports fan, right? Because we have baseball, obviously, coming down the home stretch. Football, NFL football, college football has started. Um, NBA training camps are now open. They had media day today, Monday, as we're recording this. So there's just, you know, a lot going on. And so, um, yeah, as a sports fan, you got to be happy at this time of the year. Weather's starting to change, get a little cooler. So, yeah, it's all good, man. All good. And, um, you know, so can't complain. Can't complain at all. Um, yeah, man. And and that little chill you feel in the air, Jeff, that's October baseball coming. It is. It is. And you know what? It's funny. So saying that, the little chill in the air, I, I was talking to a friend today about the MLB pennant races, right? And, you know, one of the biggest surprises, if not the biggest surprise in baseball this year, has to be the Cleveland Guardians, right? Winning the AL Central Division. And you know what I was thinking about today is that, first of all, the Guardians – seem to be a very good team, fundamentally sound, right? They do all the little things well, right? But then I was thinking, man, somebody's got to go to Cleveland. They better <laughs> hope. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they better hope that it's not, you know, that winter doesn't come early. <laughs> you know what I yeah. Mean? You know what I mean? Because that, yeah, that, that could affect the game, man. You know that what I mean? That could affect the game or two. Yes. They can. The the weather can get rough over there. Ball grip starts messing around. You get a ball mm -hmm. inside. You swing the bag. It might sting your hands a little bit extra. Mm -hmm. it, it can be tough. Sure. Home runs can get knocked down by the yep. wind. You know, things that were, you know, clear home runs during the season but aren't uh, in the playoffs. But, um, but putting that all aside, man, you got to tip your hats to the Guardians, don't you? I don't think anyone. And I know I didn't. I did not have them standing a chance. Even when they were playing well at the All-Star break, I was anticipating them falling off. So I was wrong. These guys, hats off to them. Um, they're they're postseason bound. Yeah, I had them finishing fourth in the division when we did the um, the predictions. Mm -hmm. So And they were projected to win 77 games I saw earlier today. So the fact that they're – they won the division. They, they're winning 80-plus games. Maybe they get to 90 wins this season. It's remarkable. And like you said, they do a lot of things, right? A lot of small ball. They're not this big offensive club that's going to knock you out the park. But they score just enough, right? And their pitching was always going to be their strength going into the season. And it stood the task. You know, Shane Bieber did his thing. Uh, they had Tristan McKenzie, who I think is a really good pitcher. I like seeing him Yeah, pitch. I do too. I love seeing that kid. And and he just did his thing, man. He he gets on the mountain. He just plays ball. And they got some young guys. I think they're the youngest team in baseball. So they're, they're a bunch of young guys who just go out there, have fun. And they just kept winning and winning and winning. And this is the position they're in now. So shout out to those guys, man. Congratulations. Yeah, they deserve it. And, you know, obviously it's too early to know all the matchups and everything. But their postseason ticket is punched. Um uh, two other teams, Rob, whose uh, postseason uh, placements are secure. We just don't know exactly where they are and how it's going to shake out. Are the Mets and the Braves, right? And, you know, I've been joking about how the Mets have to go to Atlanta, right, <laughs> um, according to Chip Carey. And they do. They have a, a weekend set in Atlanta this week. And, man, I don't know if you've seen the pitching matchups, man. It's Chris Bassett and, and Max Freed first game, Jacob DeGrom and Kyle Wright in the second game, and Max Scherzer against Charlie Morton, who's a big game pitcher, obviously, yes. uh, in the third game. Now, the Braves lost Spencer Strider to an oblique strain, and so he's going to be gone for the rest of the regular season. So that's a blow to their rotation because he, as a rookie, had come and you know, like set records for strikeouts and all the rest of that and had really been dominant um, 
for months now. And that's going to be a hole that they're going to have to plug. And we'll have to see, you know, when he comes back and how he's going to be when he comes back. But for right now, that's a blow to their rotation. But the Mets and Braves look like they're going to go down to the wire. As we speak right now, they're separated by a game and a half. The Mets are in front. Mets are off tonight. Braves are in Washington. And so it could be a two-game lead or a one-game lead after tonight. Um, so, yeah, that's setting up for a big, big series in Atlanta. <laughs> and that's kind of what you want, man. At the end of the season, you want to see these teams really battle it out. And obviously, both teams are going to be in the playoffs regardless. But like you said, it's a matter of positioning who wins, who gets that bye series or that first round bye. Um, but man, that, that those three games, those pitching matchups, that's going to be must watch baseball, man. And obviously, I think whoever wins that series takes the division at that point, depending on the next couple of games go. But man, I, I'm excited to see how this division plays out. I'm excited to see these two teams really fight it out right at the end of the season. It's what baseball is all about, man. It is. It is. And look, I, you know, I, I think it's going to be interesting though, Rob, whether this series will decide it because it all depends obviously what the spread is going into the series. And as long as a team doesn't get swept, that means that the team that comes out on top only picks up one game. Yeah. You know what I mean? So If the spread is two games, let's say the Mets have a two-game lead going into that series and the Braves win two of three, well, the Braves are still a game behind. You know what I mean? And then each team has three games left. The Mets go home to play the Nationals and um, the Braves go on the road, I believe, to play Miami, uh, Florida. Yeah, Florida. Miami. Yeah, Yeah. the Miami Marlins. Um, Used to be Florida. Them all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, it all depends on how close it is. I, I I would tend to think that things are not going to be decided coming out of that series, but who knows? We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. But as you said, you know, it's coming down to the end and you have the two teams who are fighting for the division, you know, going head to head in the next to last um, series of the season. And that's, you can't ask for anything more than that. Yeah, and I think if you're Atlanta, you really want that division and have that bye week, especially with Strider being out. The oblique stuff is always tricky. Mm-hmm. So if you're Atlanta, you really want that division to really get that time off. Because I believe the next series, or well, the first series after the, after the wild card series is with the Dodgers, the Mets or the Braves. If I yeah, read that whoever, correctly. Whoever's so, the wild card. Yeah, whoever's the wild card. Is going to end up having to play the, and if they win, yeah, end they end up the with Dodgers. the Dodgers. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah. But, but you know what's funny about that? I was thinking about that from a different angle. So, the Dodgers, let's say the Dodgers have to play, let's say the Braves end up as a wild card and they win, you know, uh, in the wild card round. And then you go to the division series and it's the Braves and the Dodgers. Well, the Braves, have to play the Dodgers, yes. But the Dodgers have to play the Braves, too. Yeah. I mean, they have to I go think, through that pitching as well. I think I think the Braves can beat the Dodgers, Chef. So I think, the Mets, I think the Mets can beat them as well. But so That's my point. The, the Dodgers are in a tough spot themselves. Now that you bring that up. Right. Because I think anything past the Braves and the Mets, I think the Dodgers are okay. Yes. But they have to get past the Dodgers. I mean, the, the Mets or the Braves first. See, that's what I'm thinking. And then if the Mets win, you know, if the Mets then win their DS series and mm. let's say the Dodgers somehow vanquished the Braves, which won't be easy. No. Well, congratulations. Now you got to play the Mets with the yeah. Grom and Scherzer and Bassett and all the rest. So to me, everybody's saying, well, you got to play the Dodgers, but the Dodgers got to play the Mets and the Braves too, potentially in order to yeah. get to the World Series. So it's not easy for anybody in the National League. So It'll be it'll be it'll be good to see. Um, we do have some tight wild cards, um, in especially in 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 the National League, where Milwaukee is only a game and a half behind Philadelphia for the last wild card, and Philly's only a game and a half a game and a half behind San Diego for the second. So, you know those those three teams are going to be jockeying for a position until the end of the season, and so that's going to 
be interesting as well. Nothing is settled there. Um, you know, I was watching a couple of games and the Phillies announcers were, you know, kind of saying how the Phillies were making the playoffs this year and all the rest of it. And I'm like, well, yeah. not so fast. <laughs> not so fast. <laughs> you only a game and a half in front of Milwaukee. Yeah. Um, with like eight or nine games to go. So I don't think that's a sure bet by any stretch of the imagination. So we got to see how that plays out. Um, American League, mm, Baltimore's four games out of the last wild card spot mathematically there. Um, so you can't say no. And, you know, Seattle has been prone to get a little tight, especially when I start thinking that that streak of not having made the postseason. You know what I mean? If they lose a couple and Baltimore wins a couple and it gets down to a one game lead or something like that, it can get interesting in Seattle really quickly. Yeah, and they have to be careful because, you know, they just missed out last year, Seattle did. And just like they were last year, Baltimore is a very young and just hungry team. They're just out there playing ball. Nobody expected Baltimore to be here. That's for sure. And and look where they are. Even after the deadline trading away some guys, they're still right in the middle of it. So Seattle has to make sure that, you know, they have the easier schedule Seattle does. But still, I, I they need to win the games in front of them right now to make sure Baltimore stays that four game back. Yeah. And J-Rod's out, right? I mean, they, yeah. he went out, you know, he had something going on in his back. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's interesting for, for Seattle as well. But, um, yeah, last week, you know, the last week of the MLB regular season has, it's, it has a fair amount of intrigue. And one of the top stories uh, on that point is your guy, Aaron Judge, who as of right now stands at 60 home runs um, and is threatening to capture the triple crown. So as a Yankees fan and everything else, I'll turn the floor over to you for a couple of minutes to wax poetic about Aaron judge and his season. <laughs> <laughs> I think, man, when, when you look at the season, this man has had, obviously the, the health was always like the big question mark around him. I don't think he's necessarily, or was necessarily injury prone. A lot of his injuries were kind of freak injuries, but coming into the season, something to prove that whole contract extension situation going on at the beginning of the season, he came on, he came out, straight out of spring training, ready to roll. And he has not slowed down. Um, we call it a slump jokingly when he doesn't hit a home run in, in four or five games, because that's kind of what the, the type of player that Aaron Judge has been this season. Just absolutely phenomenal. Um, easily my MVP. I know there's a lot of debate with Shohei and all this stuff in the season he's having, which is an absolutely great season, of course. But I think when you look at Aaron Judge's numbers up and down, he's what a most valuable player is because take them out of the Yankees and they're absolutely nowhere, especially with that rough stretch they went through, but 60 home runs, the batting average up there fighting for that triple crown. It, how do you not give this guy? And I'll, I'm going to say it, Jeff, the unanimous MVP has to be. And I know Shohei's having a great season better than the, the season he had last year when he won MVP, but my goodness, the the, Aaron Judge is just on a different planet. He's shown that he is the best player in baseball right now. And I am I am not being a homer about it. I'm just stating the facts, man. Aaron Judge, MVP, unanimously, best player on the planet. Like, I think he's going to win the MVP, and he should. I don't think it will be unanimous, though, because I can see just the Anaheim beat writers, you know, yeah. voting for, you know, Shohei. Um, you know, so I don't think it'll be unanimous, but I think he'll win by a comfortable margin. Because the thing about Aaron Judge, as you said, I mean, he first of all, I do think, and I know this, this hasn't always been the case, and there's been some debates about whether an MVP should come from a losing team or not. And I'm not saying that should be a hard and fast rule, but I think that Aaron Judge is not only coming from a winning team and a team that's going to the postseason, and Shohei did his things for the also ran angels right but but i think that there's a good argument that aaron judge saved the yankee season because there was a time when he was the only 
Yankees player doing anything offensively. Yeah, you know? there were series where yes. he's the only one that scored runs right. and produced a run. Like, he literally did it on his own. <laughs> right. The, the Tampa series, the Houston series at Yankee Stadium, yeah. when they split the two games, there's four games set. Aaron Judge won two of those games, okay? Yep. <laughs> um, and there was a time when he was the only one. When the Yankees were looking like a triple-A team, you know, Aaron Hicks out there botching balls in, in left field and stuff, and – you know, and, and Judge was the only one doing anything. And so it's not just that he's coming from a winning team and Shohei's not. I think without Aaron Judge, it's no question the Yankees would have tanked. They would have because they were they, they were starting to falter even with him. Lee yeah. got down to five games or four and a half or whatever it was. But Judge, he was the one constant that they could always rely on. And to me, that's what makes him the most valuable player. So he has to you know, in addition to his performance, but I think it was also one of those things where he was the epitome of the most valuable player because of what he meant to that team. Yeah, and listen, I could go on for days about the impact he's had and the type of player he is, and you can see it. He's he's all about winning. This is like Derek Jeter level of like, I don't care about my stats. I want to see my guys win. And nothing shows it more than I don't know if people caught it. The game that Giancarlo Stan hit the walk-off Grand Slam, mm-hmm. they wanted to interview Judge, and he said, no, this is not my stage. He's the guy who won the game. Interview him. And Judge went into the dugout and let them in, and made them interview Giancarlo Stan for that one. Like, mm-hmm. this is a team-first guy doing the kind of things he's doing with his head down, playing center field at an elite level, a premium position at his size. It's one of the greatest seasons I think we've ever seen. Maybe one of the greatest seasons, at least in my lifetime. I'm 32 years old. I think this is the best season. And I and obviously I have to dig into the numbers, but I think just off the top of my head, maybe the greatest season I've ever witnessed a player have. Mm-hmm. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. So um, yeah. So you know, here here's to him. You know what I mean? He's he's on the he's on the threshold of history. Um, you know, breaking Roger Maris's American League home run record. Um, one other guy on the home run front is our man, <laughs> Albert <laughs> Albert Pujols, who, you know, we joked about it and had some fun. <laughs> the machine. And we joked about it, you know, at the All-Star break when he was in the home run derby. And I was telling you, Albert Pujols was going to win. Don't, don't mess with Prince Albert. Um and you and you, you know, were very insightful. You're like, he has five home runs. <laughs> Cause at the time that's all he had for the first half of the season. But man, what a second half. I didn't think he was going to get it. He needed twenty one home runs coming into the season to get to seven hundred. Needed sixteen at the all star break, right, to get to seven hundred. <laughs> and here he is, still a week to go in the season, and he's already you know, hit his 700 home run. You got to give it to him, don't you? You have to, man. You have to. And I had, and we had conversations. That home run derby gave him his home run swing. And after that, I was like, you know what? He's going to do it. I don't know how, but he's going to do it. That home run derby fixed his home run swing. Maybe he stopped caring about where the ball was going and he was just trying to hit it over the fence. And he did. And like we were just talking offline, you mentioned multi homer games to get there to get to seven hundred. He had the multi homer game. You got to give it to him, man. I'm I'm happy for him. Glad he was able to reach it because it it, it would have been real disappointing for him to finish at like six ninety eight, six ninety nine, and not reach that seven hundred after he retires. But so happy he got there. Very yeah. very excited, man. Yeah, Great I guy. do too. And 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 Pujols, you know, was on record as saying that he was totally at peace when you know when he's at like six ninety yeah. ninety six. He was like, "I'm totally at peace if I don't make it." And I'm thinking to myself, Prince Albert, tell that to somebody else. It's yeah. no way in the world you play all this time in in you know in Major League Baseball and you have a chance to do something that what three other people have done, right? Um, hit seven hundred home runs. 
and you're going to say it really doesn't matter if I end up at six ninety nine. Come on, sell that to somebody else, Albert. Yeah, I, I would have come back for at least another week next season just to try yep. to get that one. Get out of here, man. Yep. <laughs> yep. My whole thing was I was thinking that the, if the season came down to the end and, you know, St. Louis is already secured in the, in, in the division, um, would someone start grooving pitches to him? Mm. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah. Know? But thankfully, we don't have to get to that. But congratulations to to Albert. And, you know, I think Judge's coronation is going to be coming soon enough. Um, So we'll see. But let's switch gears, man, and go to the NBA. NBA training camps are open. They had media day today. And for me, the highlight of media day was Jimmy Butler's hair. Have you seen the photos of Jimmy Butler? I have. I I have. He looks he looks like a combination of like Goldilocks and Bob Marley. <laughs> like I don't know what in the world going on with that. <laughs> and he's man. Like, and he said, "I just wanted to make the internet mad." Well, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but but you look. I'm telling you, man, it looks kind of. And he over there, I don't have extensions. I mean, he got these braids, man, just like falling down past his shoulders and stuff i can't pull that look off i'll tell you that much yeah i could not do that if i showed up one day and had that hair my wife will not let me in the house yeah that's yeah. for sure I, I think he just did that for media <laughs> day I, I, and he might have it tomorrow for the first practice or whatever but i think after that eric spolster is going to pull him aside riley's going to yeah. pull him aside and go bruh <laughs> either <laughs> either you go to the barber or I'm going into the back and I'm coming back with some scissors. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. I'll tell you man. what, J- Jimmy Butler's a funny guy on the yeah, low. He, he does is. things like this. I-, I love his personality. Yeah. Obviously his passion on the court is, is second to none, but hey, he has he's a fun guy, man. I'll give yeah. him that. <laughs> you remember when he started like the little coffee business in the yeah. uh, in the bubble? In the bubble, <laughs> he had everybody coming to his room to get coffee, <laughs> and he was selling it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he he is he is one of those guys in the NBA uh, in a league that's filled with guys who have personality. Yeah, Jimmy Butler, you know, kind of stands out. <laughs> so. I know he did this as a goof, you know what I mean? Um, and he seemed to be having fun with it at his press conference today. But um, there's a couple of other stories, though, in, in the NBA that aren't laughing matters at all. And that is, one, the Ime Odoka story, mm-hmm. head coach of the Boston Celtics, suspended for the year after having a consensual relationship with the staffer, which, you know, the Celtics said violate, violated team rules. And they suspended him for a year. Um, I heard some of the players today, Marcus Smart, Jalen Brown, you know, they were being interviewed as part of media day today. And they essentially were saying, we don't even know what, what happened, you know? So, you know, I don't think the players have any more insight than the public does. Um, I'm not saying they should or shouldn't. I'm just saying they don't. But, um, but what do you think about, about Udoka? It's a bad look, man. Um, like you said, you know, unfortunately, from just from the basketball perspective, you know, he seems to be a great coach. They made some great adjustments in the second half of the season and obviously made it to all the way to the finals. But, you know, just from a outside of the basketball view, it's a very bad look. Um, obviously, a whole investigation took place and all that stuff to, to figure out what was going on. But I think what isn't so much highlighted and what should be is, all the female staffers that were kind of put on blast on social media where people were trying to speculate who's the, who's the female Odoka was doing this with. Um, I feel bad for a lot of the women in the Celtics organization because they were put out there, their pictures, their personal information, all this stuff, trying to figure out who, who's part of it, who's part of it. So a lot of these women's careers are like just out there now and their images out there mixed in with this story that it's just, unfortunate um but yeah man a a very bad look and it's unfortunate because even leading into the season this is what a lot of the players are going to have to answer to they're going to get questions about this even entering the season when their coach isn't there and figuring out the how lengthy this thing is going to go and and it's just a 
not the way you want to start the season if you're the Celtics coming off that finals run. Right. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. And look, you, you talk about poor judgment and everything else. Like, I mean, I don't know the details because the details haven't come out and it really doesn't yeah. matter. Um, what we do know is enough. And, you know, he's going to have to pay the price. And we'll see what happens with him going forward. Um, one of his assistants is going to now be the interim head coach. And who knows, man, he might get Wally pipped. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. You know, so he might never get back to head coach and seat again. So we'll see what happens with Ime Adoka, but he's gone for um, the 2022-2023 season. And then we'll also see what impact it has on the Boston Celtics. Um, The other story in the NBA that's no laughing matter is Robert Sarver, you know, the owner of the Phoenix Suns and the Phoenix Mercury NBA and WNBA teams respectively. And there was an investigation in him that followed a an article on, in Sports Illustrated about the workplace environment and, in particular, conduct by Sarver. And the investigation done by a private law firm, they issued a 46-page report. And I pulled that report and I read it. And let me tell you, Rob, you know, this guy using the N-word, you know, several mm-hmm. times this guy doing all kinds of inappropriate things, making inappropriate comments um, to women. Um, You know, there were so many things that were in that report. I mean, dozens of, of instances uh, and they, they interviewed like 300 people, you know what I mean? And if he was an employee, he would have been guilty of dozens of fireable offenses. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, but he can get away with it because he's an owner. And I think that's why people are outraged. Yeah. Right. Why should it, because to me as an owner, he should be held to a higher standard than a mere employee. But if an employee would have been canned for the things that he, he did, and he did them repeatedly, dozens of violations, I, I, I think he made the right call. And um, and now he's saying he's going to give up his interest in the team. But, I mean, it's a terrible story, man. But it just shows we still have a long way to go, Rob, as a society, <laughs> whether it's in sports or outside of sports. Definitely, man. And I think I'm, I'm glad this story got out because it's they, these are things that, especially in upper management ownership level, especially older owners and in, in management level, these are things that are hidden and may never see the light of day. But then we, every so often, we get some insight into it and actually see the kind of culture that's going on around these teams. Um, so I'm glad it was out there. I'm glad it, he, he put out there and put in the awkward position to face the public humiliation and have to face his players who are ultimately the people who are putting money in his pocket, right? Um, so I'm glad he had to face this and, and it's thrown out there. And hopefully he does end up no longer being an owner because he doesn't deserve the title with the behavior and everything that came out in that report, man. Um, honestly, I thought the, the original punishment that went down was way too light. I think he should have got the whole Donald Sterling, former Clippers owner, should have mm-hmm. got that punishment where he was forced to sell the team. And I know, you know, just from the public view, selling the team, they it still puts money in his pocket because the, the Suns are going to be, you know, they're going to sell for two plus billion dollars or whatever it is. Right. But right. a person like that should not be in charge of, of a team period, especially where in a league where it's primarily African-Americans. So th- there's yeah. no place for that in, in the NBA or in sports or in society in general, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And so he, he's on his way out. Um, but it's also one of those things that you have to look at the league and say, You know, Adam Silver usually gets these things right. Um, And, you know, you have to look at the decision that was made here uh, where I think they fined him like $10 million or something like that. And you know what I mean? And the money was going to go to certain organizations, you know, that deal with, you know, the type of violations that he committed against people of color, against women and all the rest of that. But um, the players came out immediately and said, this is not enough. And then you have sponsors 
of the team saying, you know, canceling their sponsorships as long as he was around and things like that. So money was part of this too, right? The Suns were starting to lose money and probably were on the road to losing even more. And so I'm sure some of those other owners say, listen, bro, you messing up our stuff. Yeah, you know what I mean? you're gonna have to you're gonna have to get on up out of here, and so um he's 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 on his way he's on his and, way out. And you know what, man? What must Chris Paul be feeling? Because he had to deal with this in L.A. with the Clippers, and now has to deal with this again with with Phoenix. It's like yeah. the anger he must feel having to deal with this all over again. It's yeah, it's That's something, true. man. Yeah, it really is. So, um, so yeah, so that's a little bit of a cloud over the NBA, but I think it's one that, you know, Sarv is on his way out. And so I think people are ultimately going to be satisfied with that. But, you know, um, I don't know if that means all is well in Phoenix, you know what I mean? Uh, in terms of the team and, and, and the team culture, uh, and all the rest of it, not the basketball team, but you know, the front office. So we'll see. Um, Lastly, man, two stories. One um, involves my Cowboys. Dak Prescott got hurt in the first game of the season. And he got hurt during what was an abysmal game. They lost to Tampa Bay in the opening uh, opening uh, night game, 19-3. to So they didn't even score a touchdown playing at home. And Dak Prescott, you know, injured his thumb. And he's out for several weeks. And now... What's the Cooper Rush is now the the backup quarterback and he's now starting games. And let me tell you something. I really believe, I'm not saying Cooper Rush is better than Dak Prescott. I'm not. But you know what? Dak Prescott got his job because Tony Romo got hurt Mm -hmm. when Dak Prescott was a rookie. And Dak Prescott came in, won 13 games and everything else. And Cowboys went to uh, the playoffs and Dak Prescott became the man. I'm not saying Cooper Rush is going to do that, but you know what? I do believe that the Cowboys now will play with much more urgency than they would have played if Dak Prescott was still the quarterback, because I think everybody on that team now knows they have to up their game, given that they're playing with, you know, with a backup quarterback, the defense is going to have to be stingy and, the offense is going to have to execute, keep mistakes down to a minimum and try to play sound, maybe a little bit boring football, but that's the only way I think they will win. And maybe it will focus their attention in a way that the Cowboys never would have done if Dak is still back there and the expectations, as it always is in Big D, is too high. Yeah, and you know what? Sometimes the team needs that. Especially a, a a big market team, America's team, the Cowboys. Maybe that little setback is actually going to catapult them forward. You know, so maybe Cooper Rush comes in here and, like you said, maybe he has boring games. Maybe he throws one TD. Maybe he doesn't throw any TDs in a game and throws <laughs> 150 mm-hmm. yards. And, eh, but they win. You know, the defense gets turnovers. The the special teams plays well. The rushing game is on that game. You know, so. Maybe this little setback is something that the Cowboys could use, like you said, to really step up on the other on the other facets of the game and propel them to start winning some games until Dak comes back and have him in a position where he's not coming from behind with the team. And he instead yeah. he's just kind of picking up where, where Cooper Rush leaves off. Yeah. It remains to be seen because at the end of the day, you know what? I I I really believe some of the biggest drop offs that we see in professional sports, you know, in terms of someone coming in to replace a starter is at the, at the quarterback position in the NFL. Yeah. The difference especially, between a starter and yeah. a backup is huge. <laughs> especially with the with the big name teams. Like you yeah. sit down Tom Brady, who knows what you're gonna get. Aaron yeah. Rodgers, same thing. <laughs> yeah. Now every now and then you'll have an Aaron Rodgers back, you know, on the bench behind a Brett Favre. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that's gonna be once in a blue moon. Or even Tom Brady for it for that matter, right? Yeah. Wasn't he behind Bledsoe? Yep. He so, was. You know, every now and then you got somebody back there. Who, but most of the time, there is a tremendous drop-off between <laughs> a starting NFL quarterback and the second-string quarterback. So I'm under no illusions. I don't think Cooper Rush is going to come in and all of a sudden be, no. you know, 
nuke rock me or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> but but I, I do think that maybe as a team, it might it might wake up the Cowboys. Because I think one of the things that I can't understand about the Cowboys, they haven't done anything really in years. And yet every year they act as if they got it made. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they they're not they're not hungry enough sometimes, you know. And I've heard that part of the reason, like some players have said, and former players say that it's because the Cowboys have it too cushy. Jerry Jones mm. like spoils those guys. Yeah, the way they travel, their practice facilities, the the stadium. I mean, these guys have got it cushy, man. And you know, maybe that's part of the 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 whole you know, problem with the Cowboys, but you know, maybe now they can get a little gritty and grungy because they're going to have to, in order to win behind a backup quarterback. Yeah. And they got to get uncomfortable to get some wins maybe. Yeah. And Philadelphia, meanwhile, is off to a three and zero start. So yeah. <laughs> Cowboys are playing the giants tonight. I think the game has kicked off as we're speaking. And so they're playing that game um, in New Jersey. Um, last football note. Ding dong, the Pro Bowl is dead. And I am so happy. You know what I mean? Because um, I, I was never a Pro Bowl guy, right? And so the Pro Bowl is no more. It's now being replaced by like skills competitions and flag football and other things. But I, for one, Rob, am glad that the NFL made a decision to finally put the NFL Pro Bowl to rest. So. Man, I haven't seen a Pro Bowl in I don't know how long. I don't even know when it's going on or anything like that, Jeff, if I'm being honest with you. So yeah. I'm, I think a lot of fans are glad it's gone because <laughs> I don't think anyone really watches it. So having a skills competition, that, that seems more intriguing, honestly, yeah. than, than having the Pro Bowl. Because really, I don't even think the players enjoy the Pro Bowl because they can't, mm-hmm. they're not going to go out there and, and risk their money. Nope. Not at all. Not at all. So I think and, a and, skills and, competition does does much better. And I think it'll do better with the ratings. I do too. And I think flag football will be pretty good too, because they'll still have yeah. NFC against AFC, but there'll be flag football. So the guys will be able to play without helmets, right? So you'll be able to see their faces. Maybe they can be mic'd up. You know what I mean? And it'll be, it, I think it'll be something that will be more interesting to watch. Um, okay. so I agree. I, I might, I might check out, you know, this, this, this new format this year, because, um, I tell you, I think, I think in my lifetime, I've watched one Pro Bowl and I, I was a kid at the time and it was simply because it was a Sunday and, you know, I don't know, <laughs> the Super Bowl and it's like, <laughs> there's nothing on it. Sometimes it used to become, it, they used to play sometimes the week before the Super Bowl. Yeah, I and think so, so. Remember, because there were guys who would make the Pro Bowl who were on the Super Bowl team, and then they would have to be replaced Yeah, because they were playing the following week. And I think that was one of the reasons why they changed it to after the Super Bowl. But whether it's before or after the Super Bowl didn't matter to me. It was one of the worst. Yeah, I, like I said, I, I, would, I could care less. But now the NFL has made that change. I think it's a good change. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the new format looks like. Yeah, I'm intrigued too. I might, I'll might, i definitely tune in, at least this first year, kind of see how it goes. But if, if it was the Pro Bowl, I'm telling you, I don't even know when it is on. I have no clue at all. I don't know who makes yeah. it. I don't know anything about the Pro Bowl at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, man. Well, I'll do it for this one, man. Uh, it was good catching up. We've been away for a little bit. But, you know, we're back at it. And obviously, we've got a week left in the – regular season a little bit more than a week left in the mlb regular season we're gonna have to come back rob with some play, um playoff predictions so yeah get, i gotta get in get the lab that. yeah that's right get in the lab get that calculator out that slide rule sharpen <laughs> your pencils <laughs> get that lab coat on <laughs> get it out the cleaners <laughs> so that you can be ready <laughs> to cut it a lab with your predictions um because it's going to be it's going to be exciting i think so but um you know we'll we'll deal with that next week but until then man brother be good and we'll come back next week and do it all again all right sounds good brother take care all right